Hi, good afternoon. This is Elizabeth Hardig with the American Planning Association, and welcome to our webinar, Planning Livable Communities for All Ages. We are excited to have you with us this afternoon, and we do have an action-packed 90 minutes ahead of us, so we are going to dive right in. You should see on the right-hand side of your screen a chat box. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar. We have saved the last 30 minutes or so for discussion, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and feedback. As you just heard, the session is being recorded. You will receive a copy of the webinar via email today or tomorrow from our GoToWebinar software. All right. Our first presenter this afternoon and moderator of the session is Stephanie Firestone. Stephanie is a national and international age-friendly community thought leader and a strategic inter-organizational relationship builder. She works at AARP International as a senior strategic policy advisor for health and age-friendly communities. As a 2015-2016 Health and Aging Policy Fellow, Stephanie worked with APA and with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, helping local leaders think regionally about how to create more inclusive communities and how to expand affordable housing opportunities for vulnerable residents. We, of course, are excited to have Stephanie back working with APA. She's been a wonderful partner. And I will go ahead and hand things over to you, Stephanie. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. So we've talked a lot about, and many of you have heard, that America is an aging population. I thought I'd just uh, put a couple of visuals up to give you a sense of that aging. Um, so as you can see on the screen, the darker the blue, the older the state is. So this is the percentage of population 65 plus in 2010. And 10 years later, this is the percentage of the population that is 65, uh, that is 65 plus that's expected. So, um, so we are aging very quickly, and this is in large part due to uh, those boomers, uh, babies who uh, now range in age from 51 to 7 years old. Uh, essentially, by 2030, we're going to have about 20% of the population that's 65 plus. Um, and it's actually, the fastest growing demographic that we have is 85 plus. In fact, uh, the Census Bureau says that we're going to have over a million centenarians by 2050. And essentially, AARP surveys show that nearly 90% of those 65 plus want to age in their homes or communities for as long as possible. And of course, we want to provide opportunities for those people to remain active. Yet, we have to recognize that today, two thirds of those 85 plus have at least one disability and more of them are living alone. Uh, we also know that people live for an average of a decade after they reach what we call driving retirement, or they give up their car keys. Um, additionally, uh, falls uh, are more prevalent among people as frailty sets in, and 68% uh, of um, the, count, the cost of hospitalizations among seniors is due to falls. So, so we really want to um, appeal to planners and call out to the nation's cities and towns, suburbs and rural areas uh, to prepare for this aging population now. So one of the things that we do, we frame it as a livable community for all ages, uh, which is really a part of AARP's official public policy. AARP's livable communities work generally takes place at the local level via our state office and working really closely with key partners, um, organizations, citizen activists, and local government, and of course, volunteers. And I do want to just clarify, uh, because some of you might have heard of AARP's network of age-friendly uh, communities. Um, so livable community is really an umbrella policy approach, um, and the age-friendly community program is, is a, a program that uh, we are a part of, that we run as an affiliate of a global network called the Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities under the World Health Organization. So what do people want when they're asking to, for, for, to live in a livable community? ARP's Public Policy Institute surveyed more than 4,500 people ages 50 and older through a series of questions related to their preferred community characteristics. So what community amenities older adults want close to home? Half of them want to be within one mile or less from a bus stop. 
47% want to be with a, within a mile or less from a grocery store, and 42% want to be within one mile or less from a park. So we know that livable communities are good for people as well as for businesses. In fact, uh, it reduces the automobile dependence and supports a really socially vibrant public realm. Uh, it integrates land uses so people can live closer to or within walking distance of jobs and community activities and the services they need. It features housing choices that are suitable for people of all ages and life states. And when I say choices, I mean a diversity of housing opportunities. And it has transportation options that enable residents to get around even if they don't drive. The other thing I just want to point out is that livable communities are also beneficial to the local government. They actually, we found, increase property values. So homes closer to parks and open spaces have higher property values than those that are further away. Uh, a walk score increase of one point can improve the value of a home by as much as $3,000. And finally, demand for compact communities consistently increases property values by more than 15% for office, residential, and retail use. We have a number of resources that I want to highlight through a APA. Um, has developed an aging and community policy guide in 2014 that breaks down under the different areas of livable communities um, some very, very concrete suggestions for planners. Uh, from that, we created a, um, an aging and community talking points, which is just a two-page uh, talking points for planners uh, as a, a, a quick sort of policy advocacy tool. Um, and then there's the Planning Aging Supportive Communities PAS report that was done in 2015. And I also want to mention that uh, last year in March 2017, actually this year, March 2017, uh, the AARP sponsored uh, for the first time a collaboration between the APA and the American Society on Aging. Uh, we sponsored essentially a Livable Communities for All Ages Summit. It was a half-day summit. Um, that we brought together uh, over 250 local planners, uh, public sector and private planners, together with uh, professionals in the aging sphere, and they work together to think about how their planning work overlaps and how they need to move better in terms of collaborating moving forward. So um, I think with all this, you can understand why planners who envision the form and future growth of communities have to really increasingly shift their approach to planning that addresses a very rapidly changing demographic context in their communities. At the AARP, we also have a number of tools and resources that are very helpful, and I want to just point out one. Um, this is called the Livability Index, um, and it's helpful. It's put out by the AARP Public Policy Institute. So they developed this as a web-based tool to gauge the livabilities of communities. Um, to really quantify the degree to which a community can meet people's needs, regardless of their age or income, physical ability, ethnicity, and a variety of other factors. So as you can see um, on the left side, these are the areas, the categories um, on the livability index. So housing, we talk about affordability and access, neighborhood, access to life, work, and play, transportation, safe and convenient options, environment, air and water, health, prevention, access, and quality, engagement, both civic and social involvement, and opportunity, sort of inclusion and possibilities. And you see on the right-hand side, uh, we provided just an example uh, of how, you can, how we determine livability. So uh, you see on the left inside that box is metrics, which really look at sort of what's there now, uh, and then the policies are um, sort of the institution of, of policies that will guide future development. Um, so in this case, under transportation, you can see um, any state and local complete streets policy would award points um, for a community. And again, you can, um, on that first slide that I have before, I'm going to go back just to show you what that looks like. Um, this livability index, you can just type in your address down to um, your, your actual address where you live or where you're interested perhaps in moving to, um, and we get down to the city or even the neighborhood level to assess the livability. 
So with that, um, as a, an introduction, I want to introduce the people who are going to present to you uh, on the topic that we discuss at this Livable Community Summit that I mentioned at the uh, Aging in America conference in March. So uh, the people who are presenting are all part of the planning committee that put together that conference and executed it, um, and each of them is going to present a little piece of what was discussed and some of the, the findings from, from that summit. So um, first is Brad Winnick, um, who's an AICP, uh, an urban planner and an architect with uh, both Master of Urban Planning and a Policy and a Master of Architecture degree, uh, both from the University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, Brad's a planning consultant who has managed downtown, community, neighborhood, transportation, waterfront, and open space planning projects for a range of public and private sector clients. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago's College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs, where he teaches uh, a couple of graduate classes. Uh, as well as on the board um, of uh, Age Options, which is the Area Agency on Aging of uh, suburban Cook County, and on the board of uh, the Housing Opportunities and Maintenance for the Elderly Home. So Brad uh, speaks, teaches, and consults and writes on this topic, and in July 2015, he published that document I mentioned earlier, Planning Age, Aging Supported Communities. Uh, he wrote that, uh, co-wrote that for the American Planning Association. And Brad is going to speak today about community health and transportation issues. Our second presenter uh, will be Jana Linet, who is um, a senior strategic plan, strategic policy advisor on the Livable Communities team here at AARP's Public Policy Institute. Uh, here, Jana manages AARP's transportation research agenda and is responsible for developing the content of the Livable Communities chapter of AARP's policy book which is adopted by the AARP Policy Council and Board. Her research and videography focus on a broad range of planning and policy issues, including human services transportation coordination, transit-oriented development, redesign for active living, and the travel patterns of older adults. Jana also received her Master's in Urban and Environmental Planning from the University of Virginia. She serves on the Transportation Research Board's Safe Mobility for Older Persons Committee, and uh, between 20, uh, 2009 and 2015, she served as a Transportation Commissioner for Arlington County, Virginia, and as a Transportation Commissioner Representative on the County's Public Facilities Review Committee and School Multimodal Transportation Committee. Anna is going to talk about social interaction. Our third presenter on safe and accessible housing um, is Esther Greenhouse. Um, Esther, I want to just point out, um, uh, has a bit of a family emergency, so she may not be able to join us, and um, if so, uh, our next presenter, Laura, will cover some of the topics that she was going to present. But uh, just briefly, Esther was also instrumental in uh, planning uh, and executing the summit. She's an environmental gerontologist, a specialist on the impact of the built environment on older adults, and uh, she has also, also co-authored sections of the American Planning Association's Aging and Community Policy Guide that I mentioned earlier. Um, Esther has a, a BS, uh, MS, and doctoral studies in the Departments of Design and Environmental Analysis and City and Regional Planning at Cornell University, where she is an interim lecturer and advisor. And finally, uh, Laura Keyes, uh, Dr. Laura Keyes is our, our last speaker presenting on healthy foods. Uh, Laura is an, uh, also a, a certified planner and holds the position of lecturer in nonprofit leadership skills for the Department of Public Administration at the University of North Texas. Her doctoral dissertation examined age-friendly cities, the bureaucratic responsiveness effects on age-friendly policy adoption. And Dr. Keyes previously served as the Manager of Community Planning and Development in Atlanta's Area Agency on Aging. She served in multiple capacities in the ages, areas of transportation, housing, and aging. And most recently, she published her research specific to aging policy in Public Administration Quarterly in 2017. So uh, with that, I want to go ahead and pass uh, the baton to our first speaker, Brad Winnick. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, 
Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be speaking to a group of over 200 planners who want to hear about planning livable communities for all ages. So in a way, we're kind of bringing the band back together from uh, the summit in March that you, you heard about from Stephanie. Um, I'm getting a little bit of a ring, kind of a feedback in my ear, so I hope I'm sounding OK to you all. I'll try to make it through. Uh, As you might uh, recognize from my voice, I'm the token male on the panel, but what you may not recognize is I'm probably also the, the token boomer on the panel that, that Stephanie just described previously. Oh, I've lost the uh, screen. Elizabeth, I'm not sure if there's anything you, you can do from your end, but I've somehow lost the screen, so. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to advance your slides. Um, if if, if you can get, through. yeah, if you can get back to it, it just disappeared on me. I didn't even touch anything, so. Did it go to sleep? Uh, I just, I, I don't even see the, the go to, I don't even see go to webinar at this point. So I've got a connected to, and it should be beginning shortly, but. Um, I, I don't know why. I'll, I'll just run through it. If you can go to the to the second slide, this says community health and transportation. Um, so, yes, what is the linkage? Thank you. What is the linkage between what we are doing today and plan for health? I I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because the more than 200 people who have dialed in because they're engaged with the plan for health program of, of APA, I just pulled from the APA's website the goals of the plan for health program and it speaks to the integration of planning and public health where we live, work, and play. And I think one of the key messages for everybody to take home today is that we're talking about truly integrating planning from all the different perspectives that we'll be talking about, each of the speakers, that works for livable communities, that work for people throughout their lifespan. Elizabeth, if you could go to the next slide. The no wrong door concept. The aging network refers to the no wrong door concept, which says that no matter how somebody enters or, or first engages with the aging network, there is never a wrong door to come in, and that once you're in the network, once, you're, you know, once you've got connected to the resources of the network, you may be able to benefit from a variety of different ways of engagement with the network. For instance, an individual may first connect to a service provider within the aging network to inquire about the need for home-delivered meals, and through some engagement with that person, it may become clear that really they've got other issues as well, issues that could include, for instance, chronic disease self-management concerns. So there's no wrong door to get in, and once you've connected to the network, you can find adequate and appropriate support for various needs. Similarly, somebody may come looking to find out if they can get some help with chores around their house, and through some engagement that might become clear that really they've got other issues that could include things such as financial abuse. So my goal is to let's take this approach, the no wrong door concept, and apply it to the planning sector as well. So that regardless of how a community addresses becoming or increasing their ability to be a, a livable community, that an integrating planning approach can support the needs, the evolving needs of older adults. Certainly not exclusively older adults, but one of the, one of the needs. Next slide, please. So the, the key takeaways from the summit in the spring in the community health category, and I don't have to read it to you, you've got it there, but it talked about the need to coordinate and to, to bridge assets and partners find areas where there are service gaps 
and develop messaging that clarifies and, and engages participation. Now, transportation was a common theme, but it wasn't one of the specifically identified discussion topic areas for the summit, but it was so transcendent and it came through and everything that a lot of people certainly talked about the need for both, you know, the challenges that need to be addressed on both transportation and not, for, pardon me, traditional and non-traditional transportation options. So what I want to do is I want to give a brief recap of a couple of the examples that we had the proponents speaking to at the summit, and then I'll give a little bit of an update of some of them. So the two programs that were presented at the summit were the first two on the next slide, on the Promising Practices slide, the Kane County Planning Cooperative and the Evanston Transportation Planning for All. In addition, I'm going to speak briefly about the Chinatown Vision Plan, which was not presented at the summit. The next slide, please. So the Kane County Planning Cooperative, and again, I don't have to read this for all of you, but it's a really exemplary uh, example of integrating planning, which in Kane County uh, was originally identified as health, transportation, developed planning, and really having the staff and the, and the documents and the plans each be referring and mutually reinforcing to one another. So the planning cooperative that, that institutionalized this was created at the core of their 2040 regional plan, which is called Healthy People, Healthy Living, and Healthy Communities. Now, I know many of you may be familiar with the King County Planning Cooperative. Next slide, please because they continue to be an active first cohort member of Planning for Health, continuing to further the mission of integrating planning at both the regional and the state levels. But in my conversations in preparation for this show, for this webinar with Jackie Forbes from Kane County, Jackie indicated to me that Kane County, because of its leadership role, was invited to participate in a public health equity resource group that the regional MPO in the metropolitan Chicago area has convened as part of its just starting its new on to 2050 comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. So the, the city of Evanston, where I was born and raised parenthetically, a transit planning for all program is part of an integrated program in the city of Evanston for whom the transportation and mobility goals include, and you can see in inclusionary planning, expanding options and improving connections, and linking transportation to healthy, active uh, community and working across agencies. So in the case of Evanston, they've also got an age-friendly uh, initiative and they've worked to link the age-friendly initiative to the Evanston Transportation Planning for All program. Next slide, please. Since the APA ASA Summit in March, Evanston has launched a new pilot program that provides door-to-door -door service in two ways, both on a direct trip basis, individually organized, and on a, on a shuttle basis using uh, vans and buses and train drivers and this was done uh, in, in partnership with the Council for Jewish Elderly in Chicago metropolitan area so again this is an example of an ongoing integrated planning approach linking in Evanston transportation planning transit planning and the needs of the older adults within the community so if we can go to another good example, the Chinatown Vision Plan, I wanted to introduce this plan as another example, another uh, no wrong door approach to integrating community uh, health and transportation planning with other plans. So the Chinatown Vision Plan was developed over a couple of years by a community group in Chicago's Chinatown community. In a, with assistance from this metropolitan planning organization and local officials and business and residents. And one of the many goals, this was a comprehensive plan for the community, but one of their specifically articulated goals 
uh, in good part due to the demographics of the community, was to become Chicago's true age-friendly neighborhood. Now they, you know, came up with a broad range of recommendations. Uh, next slide, another good example, recommendations in, in all sorts of different areas. But what I wanted to highlight in the following slide, the update since the ASA APA Summit, is that Healthy Chicago 2.0 is a City of Chicago Department of Public Health initiative to try to put health in all planning, exactly what you all have been talking about and we all have been talking about. And through this very broad and inclusive Healthy Chicago 2.0, they were able to come up with some seed grants. And next slide, one of the updates since the summit is that the the Chicago, the um, organization that formed and is implementing the Chinatown Vision Plan was awarded a Healthy Chicago 2.0 grant, which they are going to use to promote physical activities, mainly walking and bike paths and the support of infrastructure for it, in good part to, to benefit the age friendliness of the Chinatown population. So I think my time is up. Uh, the final slide, bottom line, it's all about integrated planning. Uh, we, we hope, I apologize for the clumsiness of having to not be able to speak to the actual presentation. Fortunately, I've got it printed out here. So thank you so much. And I do want to give a shout out to the three uh, amazing women who are the, the uh, the point persons on each of the three plans I described, and they all have allowed me to give their contact information as well. Please, if you do reach out to them with any follow-up to reference this webinar when you do so. So thank you much. Elizabeth, I'm not going to be able to hand it off to Jana, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to rely on you one last time. Great. Thank you, Brad. And Jana, you should be all set. Okay. So let's see. I I'm not able to. Oh, there it goes. It looks like if I use my mouse, I can advance the slide. Okay. So this is Jana Linet. I'm with AARP's Public Policy Institute, and I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about social interaction. And as city planners. We can all work with others in our community, such as aging experts, parks and recreation officials, um, nonprofit organizations, and others to really understand how the built environment can interact with the programmed environment to provide very intergenerational programming and activities for people of all ages. So I had the privilege of facilitating a breakout session at the ASA APA Summit with an absolutely brilliant group comprised of both city planners, um, directors from area agencies on aging, as well as others, who got this big picture of how do you take the built environment and the social environment, the programming and service environments, how do you blend them together to really improve social integration within our communities. So before I talk about um, the vision and recommendations from our breakout group, I want to just give a little bit of background and evidence for why this is so important for planners to be thinking about as part of your work. Um, so being isolated from others isn't just about feeling lonely it actually may increase your chances of an early death. And studies have found that the lack of social connections can increase the risk of death by at least 50%, and in some circumstances by as much or more than 90%. Putting this into terms that we might also understand is you would have to smoke the equivalent of 15 cigarettes a day to have the same health impact of being 
socially isolated over a prolonged period of time. And it affects um, many, many older adults. It will be affecting more of a population. It's a population that is particularly affected by loneliness um, as we age and become less connected in our communities. But it's something that really spans the lifespan. We can see health impacts up here, uh, you know, in childhood as well. So looking for those opportunities for social integration across the lifespan is, is very important. And we need to figure out how do we pull people back into the stream of life in the communities. And there's no better way to do this by putting our collective brains together with people outside our discipline to make this happen. Now, the opposite of social isolation is civic and social interaction or social engagement. And one of the ways as planners that we can help facilitate this is of course through very um, authentic public involvement processes so that people of all ages feel welcome to provide input into the vision for their future as part of kind of community planning processes. But at the same time, we recognize that there's a lot of folks in the community who are not going to participate in those processes, no matter how well they're designed. So we can also be thinking about and talking with other you know, professionals and uh, volunteers in the community about how do we design the, the built environment and then program that environment for healthy living. This is my summary slide from the breakout group recommendations. And I want to start um, just by saying that the, the breakout group that I facilitated defined a desired outcome to begin with for what they meant for social isolation. And what they wanted to see is social interaction um, that's naturally occurring, naturally intergenerational, and naturally in income diverse. And they specifically said that they didn't want social interaction to look like programming for seniors or for those old people. And folks from um, attending the American Society on Aging Conference that week were um, really highlighted that many older adults and communities are turned off by programming at senior centers because they feel that it's too exclusive, that it's not integrated enough with the life of their communities. And that's not to say that senior center programming isn't important, um, but we need to be offering a range of different opportunities for people across the lifespan to get involved. The group said that we know we're going to be successful when people stay active in their communities throughout their lives and when we can stop thinking about aging deliberately. And I think before we get to that point, we have a long way to go, and it's actually quite useful to think about aging deliberately as we um, go about and plan um, both the public space as well as program that public space. Now, the key common denominator um, is public space, and this is something that the group really highlighted, but it's not enough to just design great public spaces. You have to do the extra work of programming activities within those public spaces with the intention of trying to bring people across the generations together. And various forms that it could take, um, for instance, neo-traditional neighborhoods built around town squares with um, a very thoughtful intention to make the homes built in these neo-traditional neighborhoods be accessible so there's at least one entrance that has a zero-step entrance so that people who are not able to use stairs are able to get in and out of the home. They also talked about other types of mixed-use neighborhoods that are connected by trails um, or parks that offer smooth walking loops, things like dog parks outdoor workout equipment to help people, bring people out to both exercise as well as engage socially. So I have some examples of what some of these might look like um, from Iowa, New York City, and Atlanta, as well as a couple other examples if I have enough time. So West Union, Iowa, Green Streets Project. Now I picked West Union, Iowa as an example because this is my mother's hometown. And I spent a lot of time there as a child growing up. And I have been delighted to see the evolution of their main street as part of a Green Street pilot initiative. Um, this is an initiative that gets a lot of attention in the environmental design community 
for its stormwater management practices. And, and um, at one point, I think they were looking at putting geothermal under the streets and heating the sidewalks to melt the snow. So there's a lot of different parts of the project. But what I want to focus on is the social integration elements of the design. And you can see, um, which is something very typical of um, complete streets or green streets project, are the landscaping, the attention to the aesthetic details uh, such as pedestrian scale lighting and um, other you know, landscaping, quality sidewalks, et cetera, that are going to certainly welcome people, pedestrians out onto the sidewalk to walk those blocks, have those spontaneous interactions with neighbors that they might not otherwise bump into. But also as part of the West Union project, they built a small amphitheater in the corner of their um, courthouse block, which fronts up to Main Street. And and in that space, they go that extra mile of programming outdoor concerts and other community activities to try to bring people of all ages back to the downtown area. This is West Union's Main Street before the Green Streets project was built. This is around 2007. I think the project really got underway. It's about 10 years ago. And you can see that West Union was not completely lifeless. There are a number of cars parked on Main Street. There were still shops open. Um, but it is a town that's challenged by many of the similar challenges of other rural agriculturally based communities. West Union has a population of less than 2,500. It's been losing population as um, people graduate from high school, go on to college, and not return home. It's an aging population. So they really wanted to reinvent their community as a Main Street community and bring some more life back to downtown. And um, I think they've come a long way. My mother describes Main Street in her childhood growing up in high school where it would be the equivalent of uh, King Street in Old Town Alexandria if anyone's been there on a Friday night where the sidewalks are just so full that you have to yield to the oncoming pedestrians. There's street musicians and lots and lots of activity going on. So again, I think um, through this Green Streets project, uh, some of that is coming back to life. It's a wonderful activity of what a, a small community can do by putting funding together through various uh, grant sources to make that happen. Now, let me move to our largest city in the United States, New York City, in the High Line. Um, some of you may have visited and walked the High Line when you were in town uh, in New York City for the conference this past spring. And this is um, um, open space linear trail system that's built on an abandoned right-of-way, elevated rail right-of-way that was in operation from about 1934 to 1980. And it also receives a lot of kudos in the environmental planning community for its sustainable infrastructure and design. Um, but it also has put in um, programming for the spaces to bring people of different ages out to be active and to socialize. So you can see a couple of these examples um, from Friends of the Sideline where you know, kickboxing may attract somewhat of a younger crowd, but Tai Chi programmed um, in the open space is something much more intergenerational. And looking for those types of opportunities to think across the lifespan for programming great civic spaces. Another project that I love Can folks hear me? I, I just got a. Yes, we lost you for just a second, but it sounds like you're back. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I did not touch my phone. Um, the Atlanta Built Line Project is another um, project that combines um, development along an abandoned uh, rail corridor. It's uh, basically 22 miles that is envisioned and is being built out as a rail and uh, pedestrian bicycle corridor connect connecting a number of different mixed use uh, nodes along the corridor. And it um, 
also uh, does a lot of uh, activity programming. Various nonprofit groups are instrumental and volunteers instrumental in helping to program the public spaces that do exist along the trail. I believe this Saturday evening is the annual lantern walk that basically lights up the trail um, with a glowing procession of light, music, and color along one of the trails as part of this project. Um, some research that's been done, one project uh, funded by Active Living Research found that trail systems that connect these walkable um, mixed-use uh, hubs of higher density development tend to attract the greatest levels of physical activity uh, uh, relative to other trail systems. Uh, in a study that I did, a completely separate study for the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission back in 2000. Six, we interviewed adults throughout Northern Virginia, age 75 and older, and found that those adults living in the walkable mixed-use transit-oriented development in town center communities of Northern Virginia um, took 20% more trips per week, many of those um, on foot or public transportation. So I'm going to go through these very quickly. Um, one of my favorite projects is Guadalajara's Open Streets project called the Via Recreativa. And I have a video on this on YouTube if you'd like to see examples of this. But this is every Sunday, and every Sunday for the past 10 years or so, Guadalajara has set, shut down 41 miles of its streets, connecting wealthy and poor neighborhoods across the city. Um, filling up parks, nonprofits, organizing various activities along all of the parks. And more than 400,000 people come out every week to bike, walk, rollerblade, skate, you name it. And it is very intergenerational. You see people of all ages uh, enjoying this wonderful open space. I don't have time to talk in detail, but the Beale House Arts Program in San Antonio, Texas is a wonderful example of engaging um, older adults in art to become much more socially engaged. And there's some good um, academic research that supports the, the notion that this type of social engagement can lead to positive health outcomes. And then a final example is uh, AARP's involvement in building a grandparents' park in Wichita, Kansas where I believe the city donated, this is in um, yeah, Wichita, the, the city donated land, AARP and other nonprofits uh, put up the construction costs, and they built this park to help grandparents, many of whom were caring for their grandchildren during the day, have a space where they could go as older adults to socialize and exercise, as well as giving their grandchildren a place uh, to do the same. So, and, and Stephanie mentioned our age-friendly communities program. Um, the social environment along with the built and service environments are all very important aspects of the age-friendly communities program. So it, it really helps communities kind of get beyond just focusing on the built environment through planning and figure out that social uh, piece as well. And Stephanie did talk about the livability index Social engagement is one of the things that we measure within that index. So I will wrap up and, and move on to Laura. But I'll just point out the quickest way to get to resources from AARP is through aarp.org forward slash livable. You can find all our resources from there. Thank you, Jana. Um, this is Laura Keyes. And, um, Thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. I am going to help Esther out um, today by covering the content of her slides because we feel like they are very useful for this overall discussion and just our ongoing education on this topic. And unfortunately, Esther uh, wasn't able to be with us today. So I uh, just want to help our, our colleague out. But as I go through the slides, other colleagues on the call will likely um, add some insight as well, so we can really give you a full understanding of some of the themes and concepts of Esther's discussion. So um, we are going to be focusing here on 
the element or the discussion of housing that occurred at the summit. Um, and uh, what the uh, tables discussed um, really focused in, and there were some key themes uh, related to housing relative to um, needs by age uh, and the lack of access to a diversity of housing choice and, and price points to accommodate uh, different uh, age um, different age groups within the community uh, and then always coming back to an issue related to transportation barriers and where housing that may be ex may uh, be appropriate by um, type or price point is not conveniently located near transportation access and then also awareness of different financing programs that may be available to older adults um, to access different types of housing options. Uh, and so some of the key points and takeaways, especially related to uh, the discussion between aging services professionals and um, planners was, you know, what, what is everyone's key role and what can those professions do to help advance uh, what we mean by access to housing affordability. Uh, and one that continues to occur is, you know, related to uh, zoning changes as probably being one of the first um, opportunities for uh, policy adjustment in our communities uh, and actually tackling some of that low hanging fruit. Uh, while zoning can be, zoning changes can be hard and complex, um, these policy adjustments are typically necessary to even uh, allow or have local governments facilitate some of these different housing options that we are talking about. Um, then also uh, related to supportive housing and what type of options are available in communities where um, housing has uh, housing, whether it's through the, the housing authority or another um, subsidized housing option has uh, been matched with um, supports and support networks for older adults to be able to uh, maintain that independence uh, as their needs change. Uh, from a collaboration standpoint, uh, really is getting at how can aging service professionals and planners create some economies of scale on solution based on the information and resources they bring to the table, um, be it aging services and really having an in-depth and, and breadth of understanding of the changing needs of older adults and planners from the perspective of knowing how to you know, work through the, the necessary land use um, changes or zoning changes that have to occur. And then always getting down to the discussion on what does affordability mean? Uh, because we know that even when we uh, begin to take on some of these built environment um, issues within our community, uh, many times it has um, unintended consequences related to rising property values and rising housing costs, but producing the type of size and choice that might be more um, reflective of what older adults need as their needs change. So our discussion of solutions and resources, you know, really comes back to what probably everyone on this call has heard before is this idea of the built environment and how our built environment and the way we design our community creates either stresses or attractors for older adults to be able to maintain that independence. And when I mean stressors, you know, if their ability to drive um, is uh, eliminated and they have do not have access to uh, transportation or other mobility options, that community now that has a stressor for them and they may have to leave and find other housing options. Or, you know, on the flip side, opportunities uh, that allow them to stay. Um, so, uh, uh, we do, what we do is not design um, for everyone, uh, and thinking about what that means related to environmental fit, uh, and this is really coming from the gerontology literature and important for us as planners to become familiar with and understand um, decades and decades of research on 
um, theories of aging, um, because the literature is rich with understanding exactly what older adults need to uh, have successful health outcomes in their communities. And, and some of this can relate directly back to the idea of community design and our built environment. Um, good fit equaling independence, uh, whether it's a stressor or an attractor, or poor fit, uh, which in the gerontology literature refers to as press, meaning you know that there is some stress that is going to require that individual to adapt to its surrounding environment, or um, potentially have to leave the environment if it no longer supports them. So you know, how um, are we able to come up with plans that are meaningful that help us overcome these limitations? Because clearly uh, we have built the environment around us for whatever reason or purpose um, that we were trying or goals or objectives of our community that we were trying to achieve. But in many cases, this environmental pattern doesn't work for us down at the individual human scale. Uh, and especially as we you know, find that our overall human condition may change and require different types of support mechanisms than maybe what we needed um, when we were in our 30s. Uh, and so here are just some more um, kind of specific pictures of community that can highlight um, various situations or conflicts that make it difficult, even when we think we may be offering a great opportunity or alternative to transportation, we haven't been cognizant of the conflicts, um, such as this car um, being able to just um, directly interface with the sidewalk and not having any buffers or cues for the pedestrian or the driver. So being aware of the type of facility that we're designing matters and keeping it at the human scale is also critically important. And I really go back to something that you know, Jana mentioned in her conversation that at the, at the end of the day, a successful outcome may be that we don't have to specifically focus on aging as part of the conversation, but until that point, there's probably a really important reason to keep talking about the needs of older adults until it becomes you know, culturally ingrained in our planning and thinking, because this type of sidewalk you know, certainly uh, wouldn't give enough time, or crosswalk I mean, uh, would not have enough time for an older adult to uh, adequately, adequately make the journey um, to the other side. So being cognizant of those needs. Um, you know, and then not only externally, uh, but internally, and thinking about the types of uh, building codes that we require, or either we facilitate or encourage, We'll talk in a moment about visi visibility uh, codes as to where older adults have um, the ability to remain in their environment because it works for them as their needs change. <clears throat> um, here you can see that you know this kitchen, again, we're now in the internal space, probably doesn't work for someone as they age, it isn't following universal design guidelines or uh, universal, universal design codes. And so a person to age in place has to make other internal adaptions to make the environment fit for them. Um, and then as just some comic relief, we're not entirely sure why Esther included this picture. So it's just for your viewing pleasure at the moment or if you're hungry. All right, so what does this mean for, for us and for planners? Again, you know, it's thinking about what our legal obligation is as a, as a municipal government or uh, what capacity we have to actually influence change or facilitate change. You know, of course, local governments aren't actually necessarily always physically building the structure themselves, but maybe um, partnering with a housing authority or have the capacity to facilitate the ordinance changes within their community. Uh, and building off something that Jana talked about is, you know, using civic engagement and the interaction of older adults within the community and their, and their leadership and knowledge to help you uh, through, the, through any zoning uh, changes or opportunities to facilitate change. So, you know, here Esther reminds us to 
you know, look at how our zoning uh, eliminate, could eliminate barriers to affordability and options. And these could potentially be low hanging fruit. It's hard sometimes for us to get our head around, you know, okay, how are we gonna change this housing structure when, or our housing options when everything we have is, you know, a single family home, we don't have multiple options. You know, here are ways to start thinking about um, what our code looks like now and how we could uh, advance um, change into the future. Um, becoming familiar with universal design and visibility ordinances and becoming educated on those um, opportunities and how they may, uh, and opportunities you have to educate your city council or others in your community that could become leaders on influencing this change. Laura, if I can jump in, this is Brad. I just want to add something to this point. I think it's very important for the, the planners for health uh, advocates and the planning profession just in general to work to link the different uh, initiatives here. You know, let's let's link aging in community initiatives with housing affordability and let's work together to increase options that work for people throughout the lifespan. Another way of saying that is let's work to get out of the silos. It's important for planners on the call. If you hear that something is being considered in part for older adults, that's not your cue to check out of the conversation and the aging network will take it from there. Integrate the planning. Oh, thank you very much, Brad, for highlighting those opportunities for cross-sector collaboration. And as Esther tells us, universal design is designed for all. So, you know, thinking about it from a cross-sector collaborative approach uh, will have meaningful benefits to, to all included. And uh, here she, you know, introduces us to what some of those universal design aspects mean, um, whether it is, you know, how we design our internal access with our, you know, door handles and our entries, uh, whether or not we have uh, zero step access uh, at some location within the house, whether it is the front door or the side door or through the garage, but that there is some zero step entry with at least a 36 foot um, doorway entry so that um, someone uh, in a wheelchair or needing wider access can um, enter so that your home is visitable. Uh, here she highlights the need for um, consideration for an accessible bathroom and most likely an accessible bathroom on the main because so should should your needs or the homeowners needs change internally uh, that they can no longer go up the stairs they have access to a full um, master on the main or a full bathroom an accessible bathroom on the main and it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be built to construction like this from the beginning but that universal design principles um, could encourage that the the room be blocked out to support the grab bars in the future or to support, you know, easier remodeling uh, when the time is necessary. Uh, being cognizant of the fact that it is planning for all ages. Uh, what is uh, available for someone to be able to access their wheelchair is also going to improve uh, access for a, a mother or father with a stroller uh, and being able to easily access their community. And here uh, Esther has given us uh, some of the ordinances related to visibility or the codes related to visibility rather, having a zero step entry at least in one location of the house, um, 32 inch wide doorways, and a 36 uh, inch uh, path, wide path clear and at least one half bath on the main floor. Uh, and if you're looking for resources, um, Pima County, Arizona and Bolingbrook, Illinois are two communities that you could look to for uh, real practical application of these visitable or ordinances. And so here are some additional resources uh, that she's put together uh, for you that may be of interest uh, and use to you as you continue uh, with your journey and learning more about access to affordable and um, successful housing opportunities for older adults. Okay, and then I will uh, finalize with um, our, our last set of breakout uh, sessions from the summit to just talk briefly with you about you know, the whole idea of access to healthy food. Um, sometimes 
food becomes some, uh, somewhat of an afterthought in the discussion, but it really is central to um, our, our whole understanding of livable communities for all ages. Uh, and many reasons for that, but the most important is because food is a basic human need. Uh, and um, thinking about how to achieve to higher levels of fulfillment, um, Maslow's um, theory reminds us that if we can't even attain our access to basic food, which is a requirement, a basic requirement, we will not be successful in achieving higher levels of, of growth. Uh, and so thinking about food access, though, it's also about access to a diversity of food items that support an overall healthy diet. Where we live and where food is located begins to define what the CDC calls a food environment. Um, and so if one is not well connected to diverse food options, it may become very difficult to um, achieve the, uh, this basic level of need, this fundamental need of having food. Um, and so food, therefore, just becomes central to the overall equation of healthy living. We, we really can't talk about healthy living without having food as part of that discussion. Um, so when we think about food and community, just simple mapping brings to life the realization that many individuals do not have easy access to food just in general, and let alone having access to healthy, diverse food options. Um, so you can see by concentrations on this map, in, especially in the Southeast, uh, that certain parts of the country um, really are struggling to, to have access to healthy food. Um, so if we're planning for a livable community, it just really makes sense that we include the relationship of where people live and how they can successfully access food as, as part of our planning process. Um, our role as planners is to think about these relationships to reduce the barriers that limit people's access to these food resources. And again, thinking of, about it from the context that it's, it's access to food that matters, to, to healthy food. So relative to age-friendly and what this means to age-friendly communities, um, food becomes a central part, food access becomes central to the discussion of whether an older adult can remain independent in the community and achieve successful health outcomes. And from a broader context, even the Older Americans Act administers nutrition programs for older adults in our communities. You may be familiar with programs such as Meals on Wheels or your community may be um, um, uh, hosting congregate uh, group settings in your senior centers uh, as a means of reducing food insecurity for older adults. The Older Americans Act has been uh, working uh, with aging service professionals for decades uh, through, through this program to reduce food insecurity. Through the Age Friendly Communities Initiatives, um, they typically reference food access as part of a criteria for planning and giving consideration um, of basic access to these everyday needs. Working and coordinating between aging services professionals and planners, though, can help bring to the surface um, important considerations for older adults, including you know, changes that they may be facing or experiencing with their overall nutrition, um, maybe in, uh, financial insecurities that are causing them or requiring them to really stretch their budget to be able to access food, uh, whether they are um, utilizing supplemental nutrition programs, the SNAP program to buy food, and what that means. Is, it, is that something that is, um, um, they're, they're able to use at farmers markets that the city is sponsoring, for example, and just overall changes in their eating habits. So facts and tools um, for you on the call in the Plan for Health community is that, you know, a recognition first and foremost that um, 42 million people struggle with hunger in the United States, which you may be very well aware of, but just to highlight too that 5.4 million are seniors and 13 million are children that are living in households that are food insecure. Um, we can, as planners and aging service professionals, you know, really start to tackle this um, in, in three important ways. And first and foremost is probably 
uh, through mapping and community engagement, working with um, older adults in our community and our mapping resources to uh, create some locational and relation, relational data to understand where people live, where are vulnerable populations in our community, and where do they have access to food, um, food resources that currently exist. Um, many of the age-friendly initiatives that are occurring uh, in our country right now are testing different types of policies. Some example policies are um, increasing food options and nutritional education, um, amending laws to permit fresh food vendors in neighborhoods, coming up with you know, innovative or supporting innovative ways that uh, food trucks can deliver food successfully to maybe underserved areas. And I have some resources at the end of this presentation. These are just some examples. But we are starting to collect a growing list of policies that are working in communities to try to overcome some of these barriers. Some different example programs are related to mobile uh, food markets, uh, food policy community councils, community gardens. Some of these things you may be well aware of, and they may be occurring within your own community. But in many cases, um, for, the, for some of these programs to be successful, the city plays an important role relative to their obligations or their role in planning and in zoning to allow these things to occur. With the experts at our table uh, in discussing food access, we had some really uh, important revealed innovations, but also some challenges that I think are, are we should always have um, front and center when we're going through our planning processes. So for successes and opportunities, uh, and some of them were achieved through uh, unique and collaborative partnerships. Um, so we're coordinating with farmers markets and with um, any kind of regulations or rules or restrictions within those farmers markets to alleviate those or remove them so that SNAP benefits could be utilized. Um, there were some innovative approaches where senior centers were partnering with restaurants to offer congregate meal services. Uh, in those situations, it helps bring kind of a more community focus to uh, older adults living in the community and what some of their needs are rather than isolating them in a senior center. Um, to leverage different technology companies, uh, using food apps to help elders get food, and also initiating schools and community garden initiatives. Those were uh, among some of the innovative approaches discussed. Uh, but again, working across disciplines to try to achieve these sex successful outcomes. However, you know, we continue to face some significant challenges uh, that were raised by many at the table, and probably uh, a most important one is the uh, inability to find inexpensive nutritious food in our communities and for uh, lower income older adults to be able to find organic food, for instance. Another issue is related to the fact that hunger hides and it may not be um, very obvious to the, to the municipality or to the planners um, that there are older adults in the community that are, that are going without food or insecure. And then the fact that chronically poor older adults just continue to move into um, uh, lower, higher levels of poverty. So some of our key takeaways is that <clears throat> we need to be very careful of not making assumptions of what individuals need uh, as we work to help define solutions. Um, something that I didn't mention before in the earlier slide is that uh, some programs that had been uh, successful also were cognizant of the needs of different population groups within the community and trying to be very diverse uh, culturally. Uh, and so again, that would um, come back to this idea of not making assumptions of what individuals need, but really working and engaging members of the community to find something that may be unique to them, but that works, uh, works well for them. Um, that food and the bottom line is the intersection of all. We need to uh, look for these non-traditional partners uh, to help improve access and eliminate barriers and find innovative ways to increase access um, for older adults. Uh, such as the example of hosting, working with, uh, in partnership with local restaurants to serve as congregate meal sites for older adults. 
So here are some resources that are available uh, for you. I believe that some of our earlier presentations may have uh, referenced them, but here they are again. Um, but I've also included uh, a couple of practical examples. Um, for example, the Food Resource Guide um, for Philadelphia Older Adults uh, that may be helpful for you in finding additional practical applications that may work in your community. I'm going to end with um, two thoughts that our group wanted to share with you, and these are related to the summit. But we, we asked in a pre-summit survey of the attendees, which we had 250 attend, um, kind of where they were on the spectrum of building a livable community for all ages. And we wanted to share this with you just to kind of bring home the point that um, there are multiple ways to initiate an effort of livable communities for all ages, that there isn't necessarily you know, one way to start this process. So you can see from the list we offered initiating a relationship with a planner you know, between an aging services professional hosting visionary meetings with residents, learning what they, what they truly do need um, to avoid making assumptions about those needs. You know, all the way to performing a walkability assessment or something that may be a little more um, official through signing on to a formal livable communities program, like uh, for example, the a AARP program, um, or beginning uh, livable community outreach efforts in your community. And when we asked in our pre-summit where people were on this continuum, uh, one thing I wanted to point out to you is that we, even now, we still had a lot that were at that beginning phase of just um, establishing a citizen advisory committee or hosting visionary meetings with their residents. So if you haven't started yet, it looks like really just starting with a process of engaging community might be a great place to initiate a conversation of liberal communities for all ages. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to um, Stephanie to help uh, lead us through the next phase. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so with the time that we have remaining, we would love to hear from um, some of you um, who are participating in this webinar. Uh, please use the chat box to send in uh, any questions that you have. Um, and before we get to that, I just want to end with uh, a little bit of information about, uh, so we did this summit, where we're going from here. So uh, first of all, uh, we are doing, I've been asked by American Society and Aging to do a second uh, Livable Communities for All Ages Summit at their Aging in America conference in March 2018. That's in San Francisco. Um, as Laura just talked about, we did this pre-survey from the 2017 summit. Uh, we also just uh, are sending out actually today a post-survey, which is just about six months later, uh, to get a sense of how we might have moved the needle and some of the issues that people are encountering as they're going out and trying to, uh, to work across the aisle between planners and aging network folks and advancing livable communities for all ages. Uh, we also, a few of us are writing an article um, about our findings from that in uh, an international journal. Um, separate from that, uh, AARP International and the APA's International Division have launched um, some research that we are working on together um, uh, in the international sphere. So essentially, while we're continuing this national conversation, we are also taking the conversation to colleagues, um, uh, fellow planners around the world. Um, and really, the idea is trying to figure out what motivates planners to engage in this topic, to incorporate um, aging considerations into their re regular day-to-day -day work. Um, of planning, and so um, so that's really something that we're hoping that you all participate in as well. Um, uh, we're calling it "How to Get Planners to Play." Uh, essentially, we're doing a survey in October, November. We'll also be doing a um, a session at the online conference World Town Planning Day on November eighth, um, and so we we will an um, APA will send to um, out to all of you a, a survey link and a reminder of that conference session as follow up to this call. Uh, we're also uh, going to facilitate a discussion at the APA's 2018 National P uh, Planning Conference, which is in New Orleans uh, in April. And, um, and that will, again, be a continuation once we have some survey data um, of that conversation with planners. Uh, finally, we're also starting to collect good practices uh, as a part of the survey, uh, and we'll be developing an online, um, an open online platform where planners can both learn about and share good practices in planning for aging. 
Uh, and we have a group of professional planner volunteers who um, will follow up with other planners based on their survey responses to gather and contribute to these uh, good practices. If, if you're interested and willing to help that group effort, please uh, please do contact me. Um, and finally, uh, we're looking at possibly doing a session at the International Federation on Aging's 14th Global Conference on Healthy Aging, uh, where they have a dedicated uh, time slot where they work on age-friendly community issues uh, and reporting and, and discussing these, this issue of planning for aging as well. So uh, with that, uh, let's see. Um, I'm looking to open up the questions here. Um, all right. Um, are there resources or uh, case studies um, for small rural communities, often volunteer planners, who may be particularly affected by the lack of nearby health care and transportation? Who would like to, to chime in on that? Uh, this is Jana. I could probably take a stab at that question. Um, and it's, it's actually fairly related to what do you recommend for rural America, which is aging faster than urban America. Most people don't live in cities, rather they live in communities that, that don't have transportation. Um, let me answer it kind of from a transportation perspective and accessing things like healthcare, which may be located a long distance away. I have a couple of publications, um, one entitled Weaving It Together, that's on our website and it offers seven case examples of rural public transportation providers that are really doing some innovative things to link people to the, more of these regional um, economic centers where there is healthcare. I think telehealth is going to become an increasingly important opportunity to take advantage of. Um, there, yeah, and, and there, there may be a role for planners to help influence federal policy that would allow better um, insurance reimbursement at, in uh, telehealth centers. But certainly, if someone has to travel 20 miles, it often is much less of a barrier than having to, to travel 200 miles. Um, a couple of other kind of private resources for transportation in rural areas. There is um, ITN America, which is volunteer-based transportation. Um, they have a model that they have taken to a number of different states. And Catherine Freund, the founder of ITN, is actually launching what she calls ITN Country to simplify her model for more rural communities and make it more affordable, um, rural transportation options. I also just published a blog on Liberty, which is a new um, TNC, transportation network company. Think of Uber for rural America that is now operating in three states and may expand service beyond that. So there are some really great innovations in transportation for rural communities. Um, I, I guess I'll stop there and let others chime in with their ideas as well. Anyone else on transportation, or, or we'll move on? Okay, there are some questions here about um, accessibility uh, and given universal design uh, that, that wondering um, how has there been work to partner with the disability community uh, to develop more ideas and, uh, and even more openly discuss a universal design approach. Um, and uh, and I, I want to ask a follow-up question also related to access, but does anybody want to uh, take a stab at the accessibility question in the disability community? Um, I, I can start off with just two examples where I know that that conversation uh, w was furthered and, and included the, the disability community, both uh, Bill Stafford's work in Bloomington, Indiana, which is easily accessible just searching via Google. Um, his live, Phil Stafford and his livability work, and they, uh, he was uh, through Indiana University and their aging center for research, and they were very adamant and proactive in including the disability community from the very beginning of the conversation to make sure that there were ideas 
on both sides because there are certainly different um, there are different ideas or you know ideology on what type of housing affordability should look like and whether you know people are able to be mainstreamed versus having supportive uh, resources and so just being able to have that conversation so that there is a diversity of options and not just focused on on just the needs of older adults is, is important and in the Atlanta region uh, as part of our work with the Area Agency on Aging and the Atlanta Regional Commission before I left uh, in 2013 uh, we were proactively including a number of people, Eleanor Smith, who has published before in the Journal for APA, um, and very much an advocate on the needs of the uh, persons with disabilities in the disability community, um, to even engage the um, the building community, the housing, oh, uh, home builders, the Georgia Home Builders Association, and the conversation, and you know, how far can we go? Was talking about universal design as a group, and and those conversations were really just getting underway. But to um, to demonstrate, you know, work in the area, we felt it necessary to, you know, have uh, committees set up that included representation from older adults, representation from the disability community, and then also representation from, you know, from the Georgia Home Builders, which I think even went on to advance a program of their own called a, a Livable Home for All Ages, uh, which is a certification program that they created after 2013 to try to incentivize um, universal design in a in a private sector way or in a market approach to increase the number of units with universal design. If I can just if I can just add one one piece to what Laura is saying is I absolutely agree with the question and the and Laura's response that it's important to engage uh, multiple different advocacy perspectives the, the older adult perspective and the disability community perspective but part of that is just recognizing that when there's significant overlap and there's some great opportunities for leverage to not go into it thinking that it's identical in the, and the concerns and the issues and the and the hot buttons of one perspective are automatically those of the other so absolutely go into these conversations to try to develop uh, coalitions and advocacy uh, leverage but go into it with listening first and making assumptions not Thank you for that. And I think uh, those are some really good local examples. I also just want to point out that at the national level, um, under the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, so um, the Administration for Community Living uh, is what Kathy Greenlee was the first administrator to bring together um, the, 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 the subject areas and the um, career professionals who are addressing issues of aging and issues of disability community. Um, and it has not always been um, um, easy, uh, but there's a lot of experience uh, born from, from that effort, and there's a lot to look at online um, at the administration, excuse me, for community living. Um, and I do wanted to just expand on that question a little bit because I think the idea of accessibility also goes back to what a couple of you mentioned um, in, in terms of access to. So, and that was a big frame for our, uh, our summit was the idea of access to healthcare and access to uh, um, uh, the, the appropriate foods, um, nutritional foods. And, and so I think that the question that, uh, that Laura raised in terms of um, you know, planning and zoning to allow those innovations to occur and create that access um, is there just an important one for us to lift up? Uh, you know, I know there are plenty of examples uh, in, in the housing arena, for example, where there are barriers. Uh, it could be uh, the definition of, of family. What does family mean? Uh, how is that defined in your locality? Um, a maximum unrelated rule that might limit people uh, who are not, are not uh, uh, related uh, by family to, to live together. And that could be a thwart uh, a shared housing program. So there are a lot of um, you know really great innovations and ideas out there and where planning and zoning sometimes pre pre presents a barrier to innovation so I'm curious to hear from any of the other presenters um, uh, to think through some perhaps examples of how planners 
through their um, uh, through their planning work, through their advocacy with policymakers, have succeeded in in overcoming some of those kinds of barriers of, of access. Any thoughts from any of our, our presenters? Well, Stephanie, I'd, I'd love to turn it over back to the uh, 177 attendees still on the call and say, what I would love for those of you who are planners, particularly those of you who are municipal planners to do, is take any of the housing ideas that you might have heard on this call or in any of your other uh, you know, comings and goings, be they any sort of uh, accessory dwelling unit or intergenerational housing or uh, small homes, compact neighborhoods, uh, any of these sort of uh, you know, housing innovations, intergenerational, and then go and do an audit of the existing zoning and building codes in your municipality, your town, your environment, and see whether any of those are, well, see which of those are permittable by right, permittable by variance, or un, you know, un, un, uh, not allowed uh, under your existing codes and ordinance. Because that's really, or I think, where to start. Not just to hear of a great idea, but immediately go and see whether or not that idea could be implemented in your town with today's ordinance environment. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Brad. Um, any other thoughts on that question? We'll move on to, we had a question about autonomous vehicles and will they change where aging population lives? Jana, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I don't know that I can answer that question exactly. Um, but I can say that I am writing a paper right now on the future of transportation and it looks at different types of technology and how it's disrupting transportation, so not only autonomous vehicles, but also, um, you know, trip planning apps that public transportation agencies are using and some innovations in the specialized transportation sector that may help um, allow, facilitate coordinated human services transportation better. And there's a lot of stuff working together that could, that really spells a lot of opportunity. But part of this paper it will be directed toward planners to say, hey, we really need to be careful with all this technology and make sure we're envisioning an overall transportation system that can address the, the problems of the past that has meant that if you do not own your own transportation, meaning if you do not own your own private automobile, then you are less mobile than other people who do. Um, and it's a huge equity issue and it, it affects 21% uh, of people over the age of 65. It affects children, it affects many people with disabilities, others who are low income, and simply people who don't want to have to be dependent on an automobile. And so the vision is we've got to move toward mobility as a service model where people are able to access transportation without owning their transportation through services um, such as public transportation, various ride sharing uh, services, um, et cetera. So look for that. Um, I don't know what the impact, you know, various people are talking about land use impacts and residential location decisions where it may actually facilitate people to live further from city centers and planners will need to have in place uh, good land use strategies to prevent additional sprawl. Um, but we've seen, in, you know, in previous surveys and just the residential location patterns of older adults is they tend to stay put by and large, even though there's kind of a niche group of people who may want to get back to the city um, from the suburbs. By and large, people are aging in place, and that's aging in suburbs. And so there's opportunities that transportation can um, be improved through this new technology, but we also need to be cautious. Great, thank you. And uh, we have one um, last question that we'll have time for. Um, it's actually a really interesting idea that one of our participants shared, um, that they have a, a, a wonderful solution to help get fresh food into the hands of older adults in Kentucky called Fresh Stop Markets. Um, but then again, this problem, this challenge, of a barrier posed by rules at the local or state level. So um, they said, unfortunately, our state won't give senior vouchers to purchase food because Fresh Stop Markets 
are not a traditional source of fresh foods. Um, so uh, I wonder if any of you have thoughts uh, on how to overcome that barrier. Well, this is Jenna again. Certainly, um, I would uh, highly recommend if you haven't already to reach out to our AARP uh, Kentucky office, and and I would say this for really any issue that you're working on, you know, in, in any community, if you think it aligns with AARP's livable communities vision, and it probably does. Um, it's just great to network with our state offices. Invite them to your annual conference. Mm -hmm. Invite them to speak at that conference, possibly even sponsor, depending on their level of livable communities engagement. Um, our state offices are great resources. Um, and I can, I can speak to that briefly as well in my experience back in the Atlanta region. We worked very closely with our state office, which you know for us was conveniently located in the city of Atlanta, and so it made that relationship building easy. But our AAA was had always had a close relationship, and when we were pushing out the whole idea of working with cities and municipalities um, to adjust and change zoning codes to increase the number of farmers markets. Um, we work closely with AARP and the state to um, work with a variety of them to accept food vouchers, to take you know different uh, food vouchers that came through senior services within our counties, and then also the SNAP vouchers. And so we really leveraged the access that you know AARP offered to to help us navigate some of those issues. Great. And uh, so with that, we're going to um, need to bring it to a close. Uh, just to mention that I think you all have heard um, both the APA and AARP um, are really working together to advance uh, this issue of planning for aging. It's become um, a really important uh, subject area for, for, for both organizations, uh, and so you hear it about the kinds of initiatives we're doing moving forward, and we really would love to have all of your input on those, so please keep an eye out for um, the, the variety of activities, uh, survey, uh, and other opportunities to be involved um, in webinars and, and other, other uh, materials that we're going to be producing as well uh, that can help us to advance this. And we need to hear from you, uh, the planners in the field who are doing this work and who are, uh, are trying to address these challenges, uh, both in terms of the challenges you're having and the successes um, that, you, that you find in the field and can be replicable elsewhere. Uh, so with that, I want to just uh, thank you all for your participation and thank the panelists, and I'll pass it back to Elizabeth. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for moderating our discussion and presenting, and thank you, Brad and Jenna, for this afternoon. Please look for an evaluation of this webinar as well as links to resources in the follow-up email in the next day or two, and thank you so much. <laughs>